Jay-Z's 444 is one of the most overlooked projects in hip-hop, and understandably so. Rap is a genre that revolves around being fresh, new, the hottest, and Jay-Z was none of these things when he put out 444. He was 47, there wasn't a trendy beat in sight on the album, and all the lyrics centered around life lessons, learning from mistakes, and legacy flexes. And yet, it's one of my favorite Jay-Z projects because it targets an audience that most hip-hop doesn't even think to target. I saw someone phrase it perfectly in a YouTube comment. 444 is hip-hop for adults. The opener, Kill Jay-Z, sets up a perfect tone where Jay's talking to himself from an audience perspective, killing all the preconceptions you might have about him going into an album like the one I just described. Kill Jay-Z. They'll never love you, you'll never be enough. Let's just keep it real, Jay-Z. He tells us, hey, my ego has driven me to get in some crazy situations, and as a result, I feel like I'm going crazy. Cheating on Beyonce, stabbing someone over an album leak, giving Kanye money to stay on title, and Kanye blowing up on him anyway, shooting his little brother over a stolen ring, selling drugs to people he loved or cared about. He owes it to his kids to be better. And that last part is huge because that's the angle on a lot of these songs. Speaking from the wise perspective of someone who's finally found refuge in a family that loves Loves him. He closes this one out by saying he thinks he'd absolutely lose his mind if he kept following his ego's will to the point where someone else was playing ball with his kids, and bids Jay-Z the ego farewell. We're now dealing with Sean Carter. From here we get the story of OJ and Mike. God, I love this beat. This beat's absolutely timeless. The Nina Simone sample, the chopped piano rolls, the straight, simple drums, it's just pure class. And the track itself is pretty straightforward too, touching on the black experience, wealth, legacy, and Jay saying, hey, no matter what kind of black person you are, no matter how wealthy you are, the trait that's still going to affect your life most is the color of your skin. Some of my favorite bars are, I'm trying to give you a million dollars worth of game for $9.99. A, because that's a huge goal of the album, and B, because that's also a little plug for title, which is where this album was available exclusively before anywhere else because Jay-Z owned title. I also like the little interlude where he's like, want to know what's more important than throwing away money at a strip club? Credit. And you ever wonder why Jewish people own all the property in America? This is how they did it. Both lines coming from that blunt old head perspective, kind of just like telling you how it is with no filter. And my last favorite has to be, y'all on the gram holding money to your ear, there's a disconnect. We don't call that money over here. Which again, is speaking from that veteran perspective of trying to grow generational wealth rather than flex fast cash. Smile kicks off with a great sample of Stevie Wonder's Love's in Need of Love today, and supposedly Jay made this right after having the first ever conversation with his mom about her sexuality. At the time, she had come out as a lesbian. This song is one of my favorites on the record for a couple reasons. For one, it shows a huge amount of personal growth on Jay's part as someone who has previously had some homophobic bars. But more impressively, he uses his mom's particular struggle of coming out later in life to parallel his own. Coming out that late might leave you with a lot of negative hindsight, a lot of regret. You might think, damn, I really went through struggling my whole life that much and have only now found peace with my sexuality. I feel like I maybe missed out on enjoying some of my younger years. So Jay takes this and reframes it as someone in his late 40s with bars like, a loss ain't a loss, it's a lesson. Appreciate the pain, it's a blessing. He goes on the flex how he writes lyrics without a pen, how he got his masters back after he was president of Def Jam for a bit, how he bought title, how he laughs at blood money now because it's not nearly enough to cover Beyonce's jewelry shopping. And at the end, we get a beautiful message from Gloria Carter, Jay's mom. She writes about living in the shadows and how it's about time for everyone to start coming into the light, including her. She calls for us to love who you love because life isn't guaranteed. Smile. Caught Their Eyes is kind of exactly about what it sounds. It's Jay on his, yeah, I grew up in Brooklyn and I can spot a side eye in my sleep type thing. It's essentially about sussing out bullshit. Frank's hook on the track talks about being ready to be real as opposed to being solipsistic or all in your head. And that's a dilemma that might be on your mind when you're talking about sussing out bullshit like Jay. The most memorable moment on this for me is when he gets all close up on the mic to talk about the mistreatment of Prince's estate. Prince's attorney and state advisor, Londo McMillan, tried to sue title for copyright infringement for allowing people to stream Prince's earlier works. Jay writes, you greedy bastards sold tickets to walk through his house. I'm surprised you ain't auction off the casket. Eesh. The next track, the title track 444 is probably the most heart-wrenching track on the album and maybe the most heart-wrenching track I've heard from Jay-Z. And the sample on the beat just supports how devastating the material is. This is the I did Beyonce wrong and I can't even think what would have happened if I kept going down that road track. If you don't know, Jay-Z has cheated on Beyonce before. Let's start with the sample first. It's pitched down ever so slightly from what I can tell, but the belted note that you hear in there is absolutely nailed on the recording and live. The singer's name is Hannah Williams and I just need you to check out her actually doing this song. And 
that whole song of hers is about treating a lover horribly, and what could be more fitting for a song like this? It's pretty self-explanatory, but the part that always gets me is right here. And if my children knew, I don't even know what I would do. If they ain't look at me the same, I would probably die with all the shame. You did what with who? What good is a menage a trois when you have a soulmate? You risk that for blue? If I wasn't a superhero in your face, my heart breaks for the day I have to explain my mistakes. Crazy amount of emotion and defeat in this, especially with that sample usage. And the last little fun fact here, this song is exactly four minutes and 44 seconds. Moving on to Family Feud. Family Feud is basically back to the thesis of this album being Jay spitting game as a wise old man. He's seeing the division between all these old rappers and new rappers within different sects of the same culture, and is trying to make the point that the more this happens, the more everybody loses. Jay points this out by joking, I would say I'm the realest guy rapping, but that ain't even a statement. That's like saying I'm the tallest midget. Wait, that ain't politically correct. Forget it. Implying that him being the realest rapper wouldn't even really mean anything because the game is in such a bad place right now. People need to start listening to and respecting one another. You can kind of also view this as a continuation of the last track, with Jay drawing a parallel to the harmony of his own family leading to health and happiness. Nobody wins when the family feuds. The highlight of this track for me is when he says he specifically goes out of his way to drink Ciroc over Belvedere because Puff owns steak in Ciroc. Maybe more notable though is Beyonce interpolating the sample of the Clark sisters in this track towards the end, adding a deeper emotional cut. Moving on to Bam with Damian Marley. Remember at the beginning when we said we killed Jay-Z, or rather the ego of Jay-Z? Well now he's back here for the ripping freestyle, with Jay kicking it off with F all that pretty Sean Carter sh Hove, and then a nasty kick drum. And it's kind of like Jay-Z telling Sean Carter not to go too soft, to still hold on to a little bit of that ego. My favorite bar is probably, put that drum in your ear, don't get shmurred. I'll Bobby shmurda anybody you herda. But the highlight here is really Damien Marley's hook and the horns that back him up. It just feels like a strut or a march with Damien at the front telling everyone to get out of the way because Jay-Z's coming back one last time. It's a lot of fun. I will say the next track, Moonlight, is probably my least favorite. The beat, the sample, Jay's delivery, just don't all come together as cohesively as some of the other tracks. It sounds a bit soupy and not in a way that I personally enjoy. There's good soup and there's bad soup. I think this is some not so great soup. The writing though is smart as always. Jay uses La La Land having to give the Oscar to Moonlight after La La Land mistakenly winning as an analogy for how black people taking cultural wins goes. It's like saying even when the culture wins, it still has to lose like at the Oscars. He goes on to comment on how unoriginal the game has become and he can't tell who's who anymore. Everyone Everyone has the same flows, girls, etc. He goes one step further to talk about how predatory labels are, especially toward black artists. And while you might feel like you signed a deal that makes you rich, the people who drew up the deal are inevitably getting richer. Not being aware of stuff like this is being stuck in La La Land. Moving on to Marcy Me, which I think is one of the stronger tracks in the back half. If you're unfamiliar, the Marcy projects are a housing complex in Brooklyn. And this track's just Jay reminiscing when he was back at the bottom of the game, walking around the streets of Brooklyn, wondering if he would ever fulfill his larger than life dream. He writes, Lord, we know who we are, yet we know not what we may be. So maybe I'm the one, or maybe I'm crazy. And goes on a little more to say, Marcy me, streets is my artery, the vein of my existence. I'm the Gotham City heartbeat. And the other notable line here is, pregnant pause, give you some second thoughts. There's room on the bandwagon, don't abort, Marcy me. A pregnant pause is like a comedian term where you pause to make room for a bigger thought you're about to push out. Jay employs these references to fetuses, pregnancy, and abortion as a nod to his relationship with Beyonce, but also to a miscarriage they had. He's pleading with Beyonce to not abort their relationship and pleading with fans to not abort themselves from the Jay-Z bandwagon. And finally, we arrive at the closer, Legacy, which opens with Jay's daughter, Blue, asking, Daddy, what's a will? I love the sample usage of Donny Hathaway's Someday We'll All Be Free and pretty much everything else about this beat, including the softer flow on it, which works much better here than it did on Moonlight, in my opinion. This track's kind of like Jay's last piece of parting advice for youngsters in the game line I like in here is, we gonna start a society within a society that's major, just like the league. There was a time America wouldn't let us ball, and those times are now back, just now called Afrotech. He raps about legacy, black excellence, keeping money in the family, passing down pieces of rock nation, but he talks about all this in contrast to the legacy his grandfather passed down to him, which turns out to be trauma from sexual assault. And this is where Jay pivots and talks about how his grandfather was a preacher who molested his aunt. This made him turn away from Christianity, but in effect turned toward other religion, finding out more about himself in the process. Turning around legacy is the overarching theme here. Jay's saying it's about breaking cycles and turning it all around.
around to get to that black excellence. And you really only get that perspective when you're at where he is in life. And in the end, I love Jay wrapping it up like that because it keeps it vulnerable and personal. This whole record comes back to what was said in the story of OJ and just one line of it. I'm trying to give you a million dollars worth of game for $9.99. Jay's at the end of his arc dropping game for those taking the mic after him. It's like here, I had a legendary career. Here's everything you need to know in 37 minutes or less, including all of my mistakes. I'll be over here being a family man if you need me. And it's kind of rare these days for artists to be that self-aware of their legacy and make something that embraces and honors where they're at. Just straightforward to the point with tons of room for Jay on the mic, just how he is best. And not to mention some of the most gorgeous sample usage I've heard. This is rap for adults and I don't really know too much else like it. It's great for someone like me because as I grow older, I find more that I like in this album. It reveals a little more to me as I learn what it means to be older. And that's what you get when you lean into the gifts that your years give you instead of trying to be young. You get something that's maybe overlooked, sure, but you also get something timeless and full of wisdom like 444. If you like this video, check out this one I just did on Tyler the Creator and how he might try making a project equally straightforward and vulnerable for his next project. And shout out to the genius contributors because you guys are a huge help. I don't know how you get every single bar, but you do and I appreciate it.